This is Live from the Table, the official podcast of the world-famous comedy seller coming at you on Sirius XM 99, Raw Dog, and wherever podcasts are available. Dan Natterman here, along with Noam Dwarman, owner of the world-famous, ever-expanding comedy seller, uh, along with his wife, Juanita Dwarman. Hello, Juanita. Hi, thanks she's for having me. She's the first time she's been on the show in person. I think we've had her on... You've never been on the show before? Well, I, in person. I I think, Lucy's never been on no, the show? No, I think I was here once before. Maybe so. Periel's not here. I'm not sure where she is, but uh, she's not here. We have a a marriage counselor coming a little bit later to discuss uh, Noam and Juanita's well, as marriage. As we started the show, Dan was making me an offer to buy us out, uh, like, like well, Mo, Noam, Mo Green. No, you don't buy me out. I buy you out. Noam Dan. was complaining about all the emails he's getting, and he said, leave me alone, world. And I said, are these business emails? And he said, yes. And I said, well, sell the comedy seller, and you won't have any more business emails. So he said, make me an offer. So I don't have any money to offer, but hypothetically, I offered you $15 million. 15, Juanita, you want to take it for $15 million? Well, but what, No. Uh, but what does that mean, um, $15 million? Well, plus, the, uh, you mean, does it mean the real estate or just the... Yeah. Exactly. You can still own the real estate. Ah, so But if you want me to buy out the real estate, I'll pay you fair market value for the real estate that you own that's associated with the comedy seller. So I guess that would be... Seven million for the McDonald's and oh, <laughs> that was in the New York Post, so it's not right. Seven point three, seven point, um, and and whatever this building is worth. Well, why would plus you, fifteen million on top? Why would you think that the McDonald's is still worth seven point three? I why why how do you know it hasn't appreciated? Well, I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. You know, whatever the fair market value is, is as determined by whoever determines these things. It's worth whatever plus, someone will pay. Plus. Okay, well, but there, you can get it appraised. Okay, 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 fair enough. So, so plus fifteen million for just for the business, the comedy seller business. You can stay on for six months to teach me how to do it. It is not enough. So let me see. So that's you're talking about like twenty two, maybe maybe plus is maybe thirty million dollars, and then one would probably take half plus child support. <laughs> that's or, why it's not enough. <laughs> after taxes, it's not enough. After taxes, after they take all of the money from you, it's not enough. But you dangle that kind of money in front of her. That's it. She's going to go. Her and Jamal will be gone somewhere in, uh, in the South Pacific. Why do you always so, say Jamal? I, I don't know. That's, that's, how I, that's how I picture. Well, like, I mean, figure, I think. Figure after, after 30 years of a, of a white guy, you're, you're going black. That's what I assume. I'm well, we can talk about every that with every guy, every. Color we'll certainly of the talk rainbow. about that with the with the marriage counselor. Whether Juanita should, you know, it, 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 there's something missing from her life because she's getting a small white penis. But <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> were you taking the offer? or No. 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 Uh, how about how about the real estate plus thirty million? No. The thing is, uh, I need I need some like that. Maybe. No. Look. No. <laughs> on the one hand, as our friend told us recently, you know, a lot of a lot of people are reluctant to leave. We should ask this. We should ask Orna about this. We, a lot of people are reluctant to leave their kids with advantages because it's not good for them in a certain way. Oh yeah, someone just said that to us. Too. Uh, like Warren Buffett wants to leave, you know, leave small amounts of money to his kids, <clears throat> and I get that. On the other hand, being your own boss, it's a very very nice lifestyle. And would I want to foreclose that option to one of my kids? Should they want that? You know, like I took it and I and I put my own stamp on things. I grew it. I, I did stuff with it. I shaped it. So it's not like it's, it's not limiting them. They they can they can take it and run with it, or they can take it and, and fuck it up, which is usually the way. Usually, what happens when no, kids take over? Your scenario is very different than our kids' scenario. Okay. Our kids are gonna fuck it up. Yeah, you built a business <laughs> from scratch. Like, you, yeah, no. I built a few businesses. So, from scratch. so now you we're giving them something that's already top no, I, I didn't build the comedy cellar from scratch. No, you but you, you, you improved it. As to whether it could be further improved, I, you you've know, you've improved you, you, it. It's arguable. You've maxed it out. Given, you know, oh, there's always other things can be done with it with a name. You can you can go into the movies. Right, you can yeah, go into management. Yeah. You can go. You can write. You, you can do all kinds of stuff with a right, right. with a brand like that. You can you can. Uh, um, right. Okay. License it out. You know, Fran right. franchise it. Who knows? Who knows? Okay. So, so you, that's a consideration. Is is leaving it to the kids is a big consideration for you. Yeah. Yeah. Or they can sell it to you, Dan. <laughs> well, if I have, you know, if I if I had the kind of money to buy it, I wouldn't. I wouldn't because I'd have that kind of money. Um, if you own the comedy seller, would you like MC the shows every night? And if you bequeathed me the comedy seller. Um, uh, no, I wouldn't MC. I don't like MCing. What's the name? I'll, I'll I, I would work here, but I don't like MCing. I never liked MCing. I did it 
Like about 10 years ago, I wanted some extra money, so I asked Estee to MC if I could MC. And very quickly, I, as soon as I didn't need it anymore, I'm like, nah, I, so, please, no more of this shit. So I that, hate it. that guy who I liked very much, but he's ghosted me since, and he's disappeared, James Altucher. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He moved to Florida. He moved to Florida. Doesn't mean he can't answer his email. Yeah. Uh, he had bought uh, Stand Up New York. He bought a, in, yeah, part of it. An and, and he was performing there regularly. Right. Well, that's why he bought it. To the chagrin of a lot of the comics, <laughs> yeah. Like doing a set or like, like doing his own show? Uh, I don't know what like, he did. Was doing he sets. headlining? And, and Carrie Hoffman on Stand Up New York. Also on Stand Up New York. Yeah, he was. And he was, he was emceeing. Oh, was he? Oh, for, really? For a while, yeah. Uh, that must have been earlier on. And Rodney Dangerfield, of course. Well, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be the, if I owned the comedy cellar. I, I I would just do sets, you know, and um, I'd probably sell the comedy cellar if I owned the. If you if you bequeathed me the comedy cellar, I'd, the first thing I would probably do is unload it. Now let me ask a question. Let's say I decided, you know what, I'm I'm funny. I'm gonna start emceeing a show. I'm gonna start emceeing some shows at the cellar. <laughs> what, what would the ripple be through the like they? I mean, they, there would be a hue and a cry. The community, the it community would, would just abuse me. Oh my god! Yeah, I mean, I suppose if you actually stepped up to the plate and <laughs> and, and and were killing, they would have nothing to say about it. I mean, some might be so infuriated that a non-comedian all of a sudden was good at it that that they would hate you even more. Bingo! Yeah. Because uh, because when John Mayer used to come down. The comedians were fit to be tied, and the truth was, he was I, very I, good. But I wasn't getting this. Some of them were were upset, and yeah. others were thought. Okay. I mean, my my take on it is whether he's good or he's not good, the audience is happy to see him, and that's, that was that's, that was my that take. That, that, first of all, that, that annoys comedians too. Like Chris Tucker came down. There's a yeah. famous story where Chris Tucker came down. And he wasn't doing well, and James Smith threw a hissy fit, mm -hmm. and I said, James, and it's time. This is during rush hour. I said, right. I said, I'm not going to tell the biggest. Comic movie star in the world he can't that he can't do a set. He goes, "I'll tell him." <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, my so don't respond to my, my feeling is is that if it's good for the comedy seller, it's indirectly good for me. Albeit, you know, not as good as it is for you. But uh, I don't mind when None of the even even if even if John Mayer sucked, the audience wants to see John Mayer for five ten minutes. Right. It, but, it, but but the important point is that he he didn't suck. He was actually quite good. Good, yeah. And the comedians couldn't bear to admit it. Right. Well, maybe, just they, like, could, just maybe like, they could. And I think you exaggerate the extent to which comedians are petty. I'm petty. It's not petty. But, but you know, I, I, I talk to comedians, and I'm not hearing the kind of pettiness, as I described it, that you're describing. No. Um, if there's killing, most comedians will acknowledge somebody that's killing. <laughs> I said in an interview that the comedians don't like to laugh when civilians tell jokes. But maybe maybe it's just because I'm not funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, or you're not their their style. Yeah. Can, can we quickly before we? No. I, to be fair, I I I was making a joke, but I've been there at the table when somebody was sitting there, whoever it might be, mm -hmm. who said something funny, and I would laugh heartily because it was funny, and, and and I have confidence that if I laughed heartily, it was funny, and and you'd see maybe one comedian, whoever it was, like a good natured comedian, would laugh along, but there always be a few comedians who would. Keep a stiff upper lip, because it bugged them. Well, maybe, to laugh maybe, at maybe. Uh, and then, they, and then they laugh, uh, like almost like that fake. You know, they pat their. Yeah. That's that's at something another comedian says. It also isn't even that funny. Mm. Anyway, yeah. Um, I did want to talk briefly. We'd mentioned this uh, last week when we had Todd Barry on. You weren't here. I think you're celebrating your birthday. So I, is that was that correct, or that was two weeks ago? It was, I was it coming up. No, I just had it. I'm 61. July 17th. How does that hit you? Is it worse than sixty? No, sixty was worse. Sixty is uh, sixty. I, I'm told is uh, is a Colin described it as a surreal experience to turn sixty. Colin Quinn. Yeah. Um, it's weird to be sixty. Yeah. I feel I don't feel sixty. Right, but you know it. You know that. True. My wife reminds me of it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, fifty fifty was was for me was you know was it was a it was a biggie, but I think sixty is a you know logarithmically. Uh, it's like the Richter scale, you know. I mean, an eight is bad, nine is. Gnome is so healthy. The de decibels are saying things like it's, it's ridiculous. But like he plays basketball with the kids, he's running around all the time, and that worries me. Sometimes I'm like, you maybe you shouldn't be doing that. I can still 60. have sex. No, I, he should you be exercising. Got it. You still got it. He should be. <laughs> any doctor will tell you, you you should never just say, "Well, I'm too old to do this," and not right. do it. Right. Just do whatever you're capable of doing. I mean, if the doctor says you got, you know, your ar arteries are clogged or whatever, then that's I don't know. Story. Sometimes I'm sitting in my yard and I go, oh, my God, that's my man up there. He's 60. He shouldn't be doing that. 
Oh, six, six and, is not and, what it used and, to be. And sometimes I see Juanita in the yard. I'm like, oh my god, that's my wife. She's 51. <laughs> no, I'm not 51. I'll be 50. I'm 50. She's 49. I'll be 49. She's 49. I'll be 50. She's, 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 she's going to be 50 years old. I, I, I've said before, I, my father, I don't think he ever slept with a woman over 40. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding. You've matured. Even toward the end of his life? Even toward the end yeah. of his life? I don't know. Well, I was under 40. No, she was in her early 40s when he passed. I don't know if they were still sleeping. <laughs> no, I guess, I guess, I, I guess, I guess so. Yeah. Um, but it, it, you know, that wasn't his style. Uh, I did want to discuss briefly. We mentioned, as I said last week. I uh, mean, off. I mean, you know, fully, fully mature women. Well, should we talk about Montreal? Is that did anything interesting Montreal? happen? You went to the festival in Montreal, so if nothing interesting happened there, we'll talk about the Regal movie theater thing. If Something is interesting about Montreal, then you know. Well, uh, uh, Montreal was interesting because we I saw a lot of mezzanines, and we were trying to build a mezzanine in a new club. Uh, I they went to four shows, I think. I I went to three of them. Apparently, the three I went to bombed, and they saw one that was good. Saw, yeah. Well, was your purpose to go there to scope talent, or were you, no. or just because you wanted I, to go I, to Montreal? I I none. Juanita wanted to go to Montreal. Esty, I think. Um, Esty wanted to go. And remember they, that they the like, IRS is listening, so if you plan on deducting this trip, you better come up with a business rationale. Well, yeah. yes. It, it is business. It just that doesn't mean I wanted to do it. But well, Esty wanted to scope some new But we, 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 all we did, we saw shows and scoped talent. And we saw, apparently we saw we some people. Um, but uh, I would have preferred not to have done it. Well, did the you kid, find the kids had a great did, time. Did you find people that you're going to use here or in Vegas? A yes. few. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, people ask me, why is, why is Gnome in Montreal? And I said, well, uh, I don't know, but... Who, who asked you that? I forgot. Somebody asked me. And I said... Um, I said... Trump uses that you know, device as well. Well, no, I don't people remember. People saying to me, but, you know... <laughs> uh, I remember saying to somebody, I don't know, but I know that Gnome has this thing where he... If he doesn't use somebody that later becomes famous, he kicks him, he'll kick himself. He wants to know... Um, you know, if he's if he's there's somebody he's not using. He asks that question all the time. Is there somebody it's I'm not worse, using? It's worse than that. There's a few people, not me. It was not me. There's a few people who've been passed on, not passed, but passed over. You mean ignored, not used, not used. not used. Who became very big, and, and they don't come I, here as a result. And I, and I sometimes I have like sh- shudders, you know, in the middle of the night about it because it bothers me well, so much. You know, nobody bats a thousand. But do do you think that I don't know that. Do you think they're cut? Not are they not coming here because they hold a grudge that you didn't use them at the time? Is that does that seem to be a, a thing? Well, I don't I don't know how you want to put that. I that could be the case, or it could also. Well, are these be, people not coming here? Yeah, they don't come here. It, it could be the case they, that they're holding a grudge, or it could simply be the case that they, they don't, don't live here. They don't they don't have any uh, sentimental attachment here. So why would they mm-hmm. why would they come here? Like I know that like when. Um, Chappelle comes to town. He he likes to come here. I'm assuming because it reminds him right. of the happy but, but, times. But objectively you know? speaking, to work out new material, it's a good place to come for them because you always get a big audience. Yeah. You don't want to work out a jokes in front of five people, although although you can if if they're listening and attentive and good. But <laughs> um, also a bigger act, a name act. I don't think wants to go up in front of five people because it just looks doesn't look right. Yeah. Like you're you're a major name. To go up in front of five people kind of is, I think, no, so, so a- affects the brand. So, so this is an objectively good people. place to work out material. So, if somebody's not coming here, I think we can presume that. I mean, it might be just a little more than not having a sentimental yeah, attachment. It, it could be. So, for instance, Nate Bargatze, and he performed here from time to time, I think. Mm-hmm. Okay, but um, Steve Fabricant was always pushing mm-hmm. Nate Bargatze. Like I know you've mentioned him before, yeah. Mentioned Nate in in, yeah. in this context, and um, and I wasn't really um, uh, on top of things at that point, and um, I don't know what went wrong with that. The clearly, but he did he did so so you 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 just you saw him and you weren't blown away or, or no I didn't you, see, you him. Didn't see him at I, all. I, I, somehow the decision was made uh, not not he was never like not performing here he mm-hmm. just he just wasn't he was underutilized and Steve was always saying you should be using more you should be using it more now I don't know that anybody I, nobody ever told me we shouldn't I don't know what was going on like that's that's the problem I think sometimes well he doesn't he lives in, in, in I think Nashville or something so he's not even here so much but anyway he became huge mm-hmm. and we were not we were not using him. Um, or not using it like we should have been. So I, I don't know what happened with that. There, there is some story also with Jim Gaffigan. Uh, he, he does here come here from time to time, but something happened with Gaffigan years ago. I don't know. It was before, it was, it was when my father was still alive, so I don't even know. Um, 
So uh, the po- the Comedy Cellar is doing a simulcast, if that's the right word, at the Regal Movie Theater chain. They're at 48 theaters. 48 theaters They're, on the year along the East Coast, and all, I think extending all the way west to Texas. August 5th, I think it is. August 5th, this, this coming Saturday. Um, so there's going to be a show at, I guess, the Village Underground, I assume, because that's the best place to film shit. Yeah. Uh, and it'll be simulcast, again, if that's the word. Broadcast, simulcast. Uh, at these theaters, so the people can go to the theater, get their popcorns, you know, get sit in the seat and, and watch. Make out. And watch... Stand up comedy on a movie screen. To stand up comedy on a movie screen. Like I mean, I saw I saw Eddie Murphy raw on the movie screen, but it was Eddie Murphy. So the question is: Is will this work? And is there a, no? I mean, ticket sales is you know are they are they robust or T- ticket sales are not bad actually. Not ticket bad. sales are exceeding what what I thought. Yeah. But um, I don't know how to judge it because uh, as I said to Bill, the guy you know who's involved in this with me. In my whole life, I've never or been or, or accompanied anybody who purchased a ticket for a movie before the day of the movie. Mm-hmm. I just right. don't. It's just I'm, yeah, you, yeah, right. The per- precisely the case. Yes. So I'm assuming this is a little bit different, maybe, arguably, or maybe not. No, but, I don't think so. Yeah. I think that, it, like the opening of a Star Wars movie, mm-hmm. you might buy in advance because you know it's going to be sold out. Right. This is the kind of thing you you decide at the last minute. You might even be. And then there's two ways to look at also. So this is um, an unusual. Period, because we have two blockbuster movies out there, the, the uh, Oppenheimer movie and the Barbie movie, which just hasn't been any blockbuster right. movies in a long time. So the question is, is that going to suck the the audience away from us? That seems most likely. Or will uh, they people be sold out for these shows so they're not going buying a ticket for the seller? Because often you go see movies because everything mm-hmm. else is sold out. Also, also it arguably, I don't know, maybe gets people into a movie-going frame of mind. It just puts it out there that... It's still a thing to go to the movie theater. Yeah. So we're having so all kinds of know. internal political um, like problems. Mm-hmm. The sound wasn't right at the at the at the um, test thing. I wanted a Dolby five point one. They're having trouble getting that done for me. There was an article in Vulture magazine today which uh, made it sound different than it was. It's also, there's always shit. There's always shit for these things. I should handle everything myself. Uh, assuming you want to, but no, uh, I don't want to. That's the and, problem. And Mint Comedy is involved as well. They, mm-hmm. they do their, they do the um, every week. I guess they do. Uh, so Mint Comedy was is is the uh, company that was started initially by Mustafa, who was Chappelle's manager, and they've been doing. And there was as a partner, Arnold is my friend, and they've been doing weekly shows streaming. So we brought them in uh, in order because they have a whole infrastructure for streaming now. Mm-hmm. So I brought them into this idea. Um, to take take care of take care of the streaming end. So, whose idea was this initially? This was Bill Grunfest's oh, idea, okay. who was you know the guy who founded the Comedy Cellar. Mm-hmm. And I and I didn't have much faith in the idea at first until I saw the first test. The first test of the movies was fantastic. It just looks really good. It, it looked, looked good. It sounded good. Everything. The last test I saw was it yesterday, the day before yesterday. Yesterday, yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um, that wasn't so good. So we had to do it again on Thursday night to fix it again. Well, um, well, I mean, you're so you're sensitive. Are you optimistic, pessimistic, or you you just we'll wait and see. We, I, I think Orna is here. I'm pessimistic. Okay, uh, but you're. Are you, I, I mean, that's sort of your nature anyway. No. Yes, no? it is. No, it's not my nature. Okay. My my uh, nature is not to be pessimistic. So you're optimistic about the McDonald's? Yes, my nature is to be uh, realistic. Mm-hmm. Which might be well, Perry Al always gives me shit because she accuses me of pessimism. No, you're 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 because you're depressive. But but <laughs> well, well, we'll ask Orna. But she, we're not in the movie. Business, you know, so we don't really know what's going to happen. Well, the big question is, and the question I can't answer is, is are people going to want to watch stand up on screen? My only experience with it is having seen Eddie Murphy raw in nineteen, whenever the fuck it was. But this is different, right? It's it's broadcast live, so you don't right. This know is live. What's Anything happen. could happen. Anything it's, could this happen. This is live, <laughs> yeah. but it's not Eddie Murphy, so yeah. Uh, you but know, I think that oh, uh, it's oh, it's hey. the dog we got what looks to be a. A, uh, a husky, I guess. A Siberian oh, husky. Wow, beautiful dog. Gorgeous dog. Hello, Orna. Hi. Uh, I'll just give you a brief intro while you're settling in. Uh, now, is that is that a, a, a authorized therapy dog? That sounds like a racket to me. A therapist gets the... Get... Dr. Orna Goralnik, uh, the world-renowned... You have to get renowned... them trained, you know. Uh, a friend of ours just went through that. Yeah. Clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst on the faculty at New York University. My fake alma mater. When I... On stage, when I talk about my alma mater, I say NYU, but it's not true. It's UPenn. Why I say you- NYU because I think UPenn sounds arrogant. Oh, God, just be yourself. 
be myself. There's nothing in my act that's myself. It, it, it sounded, Everything in my act is a fraud. It sounded a little <laughs> arrogant just now when you had to slip it in. I, I, I have to. I, I, okay, okay. If you say so. Uh, although, um, yeah, NYU just sounds like you know a state school. It's not a state school. I know, but it sounds like one. I guess so does you, Penn. But anyway, uh, <laughs> she's featured on Showtime's documentary series. Now, uh, if, if you went to Harvard, would you would you think you would you would you wouldn't say Harvard? You know, I, I would. If people say where'd you go to school, I would say Harvard because it's even a lot of people say I went to school in Cambridge. Or, that sounds even more ridiculous. Uh, you just come out and say Harvard. Harrison That's Greenbaum, it, you know, shoehorns Harvard into every conversation. I wouldn't shoehorn it in, but if somebody asked me point blank, I would say Harvard. You know. Um, did you? Where, where did you go to school, Lana? Many schools. Many schools. I spent half my life in schools. Okay. Yeah, you have to um, talk. talk, 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 talk yeah. Well, anyway, so uh, spent half your life in schools. Yeah, but my last school was indeed NYU postdoc, okay. NYU postdoctoral program in psychoanalysis. So ten you know, years there. Those were the last ten years. Are you friends with Jonathan? Are you? Are you Jonathan I, Haidt? I, I, who's? Well, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, are you friends with Jonathan? One at a time. Jonathan Haidt. No. It, 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 when in doubt, answer Noam's questions. No. No, okay. <laughs> he's, he's, the, he's, the, no. he's the boss. I said I detected a, a slight accent. Am I, am, I, am I incorrect in that? Israel. Oh, Israel. Okay. I spent um, a formative year in Israel. Years. Okay, yeah. It's very okay. slight, did very you, subtle. Did you serve, serve in the military? Yes. Uh, we, had, we had on... We'd like to talk about the judicial override, if you don't mind. No. Let's do. We, no, no. We, we, Let's do. We, oh yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm sure. Interested. Well, I, I mean, it's, we have enough to talk about here. Noam and Juanita are a married couple. Climate and the judicial overall. I thought that's what we're here for. Well, there is actually there is actually an angle. So I we'll, we'll, we'll let we'll let Dan start. But I I heard you. We were listening to you on the on the radio on a podcast on the way in, and you were talking about how politics uh, bears on people's. Uh, um, you didn't use the word problems. That's my layman's word. It, it, it bears on a psychology, on the yeah. things they react to, how they react to things, whatever it is. And I had written um, an email to somebody not long ago that underneath all this hullabaloo about the judicial override is a psychological dynamic of the people on one side who feel that they're constantly dismissed and looked down upon, True. treated like deplorables, kind of, you know, True. and the elites... And and this is kind of fueling a lot of this stuff. Although everybody talks about it in intellectual terms, you have an aggrieved, resentful population, and an elite population that doesn't want to say it out loud, but to some extent look down on these people, and and won't and won't permit themselves to say it. So you want to start with that? We can well, you know, sure. give, what, given what, that, what I, else is there to talk I, about? I, well, I, I, think, I brought my wife here. I, I, she's usually home washing dishes. I, I don't think <laughs> that. <laughs> okay, we should talk about that too. Yeah. I don't think she the, likes it. She says. Uh -huh. I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that the average listener would be quite as interested in okay, okay. Israeli politics as they are in 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 marital advice. Okay, so so but it is kind of it's it's there is some parallel thinking. Uh, perhaps so, but but why don't we uh, focus on? Well, go ahead, say what but you want to say. Just say this yes, is a of course. Yeah, sure. I can't. Not yes, of course, say. Take the bait. But um, it is also a mindset that is then inducted into people, which is to think that way, to think into like elite versus deplorables. It's a particular kind of mindset yep. that the same people, let's say in a different marital situation, would think differently. I, I agree with you. But it, it, is, so, it is a mindset, but it's a, it's a it's the political mindset. Of much of the Western world right now, it's not right. It, right. it, it touches on Brexit. It touches on, on a lot of Which things. Which brings us to climate. Yes. yes. Well, it's funny you should mention climate. Just uh, we don't have to discuss it, but I, I you know, I, I went head to head with Dave Smith, who's a comic. He calls himself libertarian. I'm not exactly sure what that means because yeah. it seems to mean different things to different people, but. Uh, but I got in. He quote tweeted me, I, 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 oh, no. which is a which is a nasty move because yeah. that sicks all this? his followers on me, yeah. and I'm. I, 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 I Is that, were you saying that climate I, change was a hoax or something? No, I said it was. <laughs> I said it was real, and his people think it's a hoax. Ah, ah. And so I got, uh, you know, I got a lot of people coming at me. But we can, if if you wish to discuss that after we get through with you and Juanita, oh. Uh, oh, we God. can do so. We're but, in desperate need of therapy here. Well, I mean, that's why she's here. You know, I thought. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So, if you you have some questions you want to start with, because I I, I excerpted some stuff from that I read of hers that I wanted her to. No, I think we should talk about. Mar you know, marital uh, bliss, and is it achievable? Well, my my wife and I have been together for on and off for th how many years? Twenty nine years. Twenty nine years, and um, we we met. Uh, she was a waitress here, 
Here. Here. And I was, and I was the owner. Story, yeah. I was 30. She was 19. Is that right? Yeah. And I harassed her mercilessly um, and uh, chased her around. She was pregnant. Uh, and but I, I won her heart, and and we were married. And I would say, although we fight, you know, she, we don't fight. You know, she's she's volatile, and she <laughs> puts me down a lot, and she's <laughs> impatient. And uh, so, but, but but as as married, I think we have we've had a happy thirty years, right, for the most part. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, tell her, have we not had a happy thirty years? No. You're still, we're still together. We're still together, yes. Well, you want to leave me? No, I don't. That's well, for the leave. children how, at how, this point. How come you don't want to leave me? Because I love you. Okay. But we've had a lot of bad times, too. Well, yeah, we had some bad times. You, you chased her down, you're saying? Yeah. Because there's a school of thought that says, you know, Morgan Freeman uh, once said, uh, don't chase women, let them chase you. But, but, uh, <laughs> but you chased her, and it worked. S- subtly. Then, then she chased me back. Okay. So, I guess. Yeah. Anyway. Not really. So, but is, is, would you like to tell me? Yeah, tell her. Go ahead. Well, a, a lot of that is true, but I think that everyone everyone's story is different. This is his story. This is how he sees our relationship, right? I don't see it like that. You want to start with our, our previous couples therapy? <laughs> yeah, we've been in therapy before. We've had a lot of issues. Before we married, we went to, we went to couples you know, therapy. I, I'm before a mo- we married. I, yeah, yeah, I think he... when because we you, Because you were already in a pattern or because you were afraid? She dragged me into it. Why do we? Why, why did we go to couples therapy? I think that was already after like maybe almost seven years of dating. I was like, maybe oh, so we. So you were already in a pattern. Yeah, we were in a pattern. Look, we dated two and a half years, and I thought everything was great. And then one day he called me up and said, "I don't." Do you remember this? No. Do you want to talk about it? No, <laughs> you can. You can. <laughs> so he, you know he's old. He's eleven years older than me. So we were dating like two and a half years, and th- this is the first guy that's ever broken up with me. By the way, I don't even know if Noam knows this. Yeah, you've told, you've told me like 20 times. Okay, so <laughs> he like calls me up and says on the phone, this is how immature he was at the time in his 30s, <laughs> to say, listen, I, I I, don't think I, what did you say exactly? I don't remember. It was something along the lines of, I don't think I can give you what you need. I can't believe I did something. Because such a I thing. was already a, a mom, you know, so I was looking for something a little more stable and serious, and he was still running around, you know? Carousing. Yeah. As it were. So uh, half of our relationship was like that. Him running around, you know. Wait, but running around, you you said, I don't think I can give you what you need, meaning maybe he felt deficient. Yeah, because he couldn't be faithful. Or so. maybe he was unfaithful because he felt deficient. I don't know. Do, I think he was unfaithful because do, he was in his people, 30s. Is and, that what it is? And owned a man. I think he's unfaithful. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think it's a very selfish thing that men do when they can can have. But when people feel like deficient, lacking, Mm -hmm. they try to compensate. Oh, okay. I never thought of it. One theory. Look, he was in. He was. He was. was, I don't think that was it. But go ahead. The reason he couldn't be faithful is because he was uh, a well-to-do thirty-something that owned a music club. That's right. Playing on stage. He's a musician. And and, uh, I mean, that's a. You know, meaning uh, meaning it's hard to be faithful given that situation. Well, how, it's hard because, to want to be faithful because you're because the options are drinking fairly and drugging and well, I don't think he was drugging, but drugging, he no. was drinking. He he likes a frangelico <laughs> and an, <laughs> case, an occasional <laughs> occasional joint, but the opportunities were were boundless. You know, the opportunities are boundless everywhere. Well, I think if you're no, if, I think I no, think I think less so of uh, than if you own a music club and and you're on the stage at that music club. Right. Mm-hmm. What were you doing? And women are throwing. I play guitar. At you. I play guitar. Got it. So look, it is it it, it was what it was. There, there was there is one story um, where we did go to couples therapy. Yeah. And the therapy session ended with the you want to tell him the, with the therapist giving him a foot massage. And I swear, I start his, <laughs> what? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I start hysterically crying. She says, and you're very, she says, you must be very stressed. First, she said, she says something else to me. She goes, she says, you must have been treated with a lot of compassion in your life. I said, she said, you're, you're very kind. And then she said, uh, you must have a lot of, st- I think you have a lot of stress. I've been studying reflexology. And then she began to give me a foot She's massage. like, can I try a little? <laughs> and the, I just start, I just silently start crying. Saying, and I, in the middle of that, I go, get up. This session is over. I like literally. Well, I think so, I'll okay, be there in a few the, minutes. Right, so this is what we. Call, well, I think Juanita was correct. To, to, to <laughs> yeah, I was. So what we call an enactment, where the thing you're complaining about that's happening out there 
starts happening in the therapy session. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, That's I never even fucked thought up. of that. Yeah. It's so fucked up. Wow. Yeah. But really, no, you acknowledge it wasn't my fault. I didn't do anything. No, the no, therapist's responsibility no. is yeah, 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 not sure. to no. seduce I wasn't like, her patient. <laughs> right. But well, um, I, It wasn't sexual. It was, it was not sexual. No, I think she was so kooky and yeah. so like... It was flaky. It wasn't sexual. It, yeah. It, are there, you it know, was like I, peace and love kind of stuff. Is there anything you guys are working on now that you'd like uh, we work Dr. Every Garalnik day. to help you with? That's what we're, <laughs> I'm working every day. Him, I don't know. What is what is not working? The se- in the bedroom, everything is uh, every, every, Everything's fine in our. Shut up, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> no, everything's fine. I mean, I listen. This is this is one thing I do all the time, and I, I don't know if it's healthy or unhealthy. I know we know so many other married couples, and when I compare their relationships to ours, yeah, he does this all the time. It's I annoying. think that I have the healthiest marriage of anybody. I know. I don't know any marriages where everybody's like, oh, my God, we still, you know, like everything's fine. Everybody's had it up to here with their husband and wife. Everybody's sick of the, yeah. leave the t- cap off the toothpaste, doesn't take out the garbage. We, we, we fight about all kinds of stuff. Right. Um, you have three kids. The kids play you against each other. You have different visions for how the kids should be raised. She's Puerto Rican. She's used to whacking her kids. I'm, I'm, <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm Jewish. I, don't, I, I, I get I, turned off when she wants to whack the kids. These are real issues. However, when all is said and done, when I compare it to the like the other marriages I know, I think I'm very lucky. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, that's right. I guess you are very lucky. Well, I, guess can, I, <laughs> I guess we can talk about climate change. I don't. About- I don't ever compare our relationship our relationship to anybody else's relationship. But you do that all the time. I do. I do that. I can't help it. Yeah. 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 Well, you, you I, don't I, ever by compare. The way, related you don't, to what we were saying earlier about like lacking comparison, ego. Yeah. yeah. Is it ego? Yeah. No, I, I make comparisons. Maybe maybe I don't realize that it's ego and I'm just uh, rationalizing this, but I feel like when I have a problem in anything in life, not just my marriage, to gain perspective because it's very easy to lose perspective on mm-hmm. one situation because whatever you're thinking about because the most important thing in the world. And, you, can, it, you know, That's um, true. Um, I say, okay, take it, zoom out. What is this like for the other for twenty other people that I know? I said, mm-hmm. Oh, actually, what am I what am I so upset about? I don't have it, I don't have this guy's cheating and this guy's this one's married to an alcoholic and this one's mean and she's uh, you know, like a million a million things going on, you know. I said, yeah. Actually my wife and I ha- have a good relationship. Mm-hmm. We, you know, we we spend time together, we everything's fine. No Noam's afraid to ask this, so I'll ask it on his behalf. <laughs> what 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 do you think about um uh, marriages wherein couples are authorized to have uh, extramarital oh. affairs. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> no, no one was afraid to ask this. <laughs> uh, it, 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 can this work? Can this work? A more open uh, type situation. Polyamory. Yeah, polyamory. Any, any of these things. Ethical are... non-monogamy. Uh, okay, Ethical if you like. Yeah. Um, okay. Is this a possi- will... feasible strategy? I will answer, but why are you asking? He's joking about me. I'm jokingly I'm saying, saying uh-huh. that Noam, he, he, well, uh, look, I mean, I don't know if Noam would turn it down. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, it is a, it, I, w- I would not turn down I, ethical, I, one-sided non-monogamy. I, 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 <laughs> I know a married couple. They go to this club uh, where they, you know, they, they exchange. They swing. Yeah, but not often, but once in a while. But um, Do I know them? Uh, I don't believe you do, but okay, we can talk about ahead. it after the show. Um, <laughs> and it seems to work for them, but maybe there's some, maybe they're sowing the seeds of discord uh, without even knowing it. Or is this, is this potentially a healthy thing if, if everybody's on board? There are many people that are engaging in what they call now E&M, right? Ethical non-monogamy, right. all sorts of variations of it. We have a few people on the show that are in those relationships. We have a um, polycule um, on the show now that we're re- taping that are... I don't, I don't know what that phrase means. Polycule meaning they, they have multiple relationships. They're polyamorous. Mm. But they're not. They are non-hierarchical. There are many ways that they define their relationship. So it's like a, I mean, think of like a um, a morphing kind of structure. Okay. Um. Anyway, but what do I think of it? Um, I have many thoughts about it. It's happening a lot among younger people. A lot. Um. I have all sorts of theories about why it's happening now. Some of them, I, I have like a lot of admiration and respect for like why young people are choosing to go that way. 
um, which we can talk about. Um, but I also see them coming up against the, the things that more traditional relationships are bound by, which is like possessiveness, jealousy, needing to feel special, needing to have some kind of boundary around even, you know, finance and bodily boundaries. So I see the struggle. But there are reasons why people are doing it nowadays. They don't trust the old structures anymore. And should they? Are they onto some? They don't trust a lot of things. They don't trust hierarchy anymore in a big way. Everything's going to lead back to climate. So just, just so you know. <laughs> um, they don't trust authority anymore. They feel like they, the older generations have seriously failed them. They don't trust this whole system of like ownership and capitalism, and they're like, there's got to be some other way to live in this world. They realize that they need different kind of kinship structures, that they need to rely on each other in ways that, you know, these tiny little boxes that we typically live in are not going to work if we're really facing what's coming. We're going to have to find another way to live with each other. We really do depend on each other in ways that we don't like to acknowledge. So they're doing something different. They're really trying something different. Okay, my, my feeling is, and you tell me that you're wrong, and I, I, where I'm wrong. I'll tell you that I'm wrong. That I'm or, wrong. or he might so, not be wrong. So in, in, a, in a broad topic, um, I'm interested to know how you parse what is biological and what is uh, trainable in terms of these things. These I know things meaning monogamy, monogamy, jealousy, you know, uh -huh. uh, and 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 how that bears on what innate differences there are or are not between men and women. Um, and I, jealousy and attack, you know, uh, and uh, jealousy of for affection and things like this. You see this in your children. This is very mm -hmm. and and at very young age. So, yeah, yeah. so the the notion to me that you can uh, really actually have people not feel jealous when they're attached to someone, not feel jealous of them having sex with another person. I find this very hard to believe. I, they, can, they can put on their game face for a while, but I think for most people, most healthy people, it, it shouldn't last very long. I think that the people who are okay with this, in my, in my small mind, I'm like, there's something wrong with them because you're not supposed to just be able to not care that the person you love is off having right. sex with other people. Can I? Yeah, I, I, I guess, uh, was there, uh, but I just, and just add to that, just to bring it back in, and I, and I feel like in some way, this is harder for women than for men, and that unfortunately, this is my feminist side, I've seen this, where women will put up with it, even though they don't want to, to hold on to the man, and they'll pretend that they're okay with it, but actually inside there, it's painful for them. Yeah. So those are all, the, you take any of those or all none of it and tell me. I can, there's so much to, you have to remind me of, like every <laughs> sentence that you said, I have a lot, a lot. To, to disagree to. with. Go ahead. Uh, to complicate. Okay. Not necessarily disagree with. Let, let me just start with like a small point. Um, any part of it. Yeah. Pet peeve, but. If someone is different from you, I mean, I think we're generally inclined to think if someone is different from me, something's wrong with them. I'm not vibing with that. I'm like, if someone's different from you, oh, what's going on there? What? What? How are we different? I don't know if that means that some, something's wrong with someone who's okay with ethical non-monogamy. They might be different from me, yeah. but let's think what's different. Um, and I know what you're saying, and I and I purposely put it in a provocative way. Yeah, I was provoked. <laughs> okay. But but um, and I and I know especially from from your professional point of view. Yeah. These kind of things matter. Yeah. But uh, I just so, so instead of saying unhealthy, say uh, uh, at the tail end of some sort of spectrum, which is outside the norm. You know. Like well, the if norms I, if I, if are, I, the it, norms are changing. I mean. I'm assuming we're kind of a similar generation. The norms are changing. We're, this is a, the, the, a lot of this ethical non-monogamy is coming from people younger. Well, so for instance, just tell me wrong. A, a sociopath, in a, a male sociopath, um, who doesn't have a conscience or whatever it is, who, who I'm not saying he's not normal, but it, it they, these people exist. In that some is way, not normal. Actually, sociopathy is not normal. But it exists. It exists. It definitely yeah. exists. And and somebody like that could be very manipulative in a relationship, right? And allows and 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 put up with certain things because he because he 
has inability to attach. Right, but this is not what so, we're talking about. Well, that's that's what I was saying. Like somebody who somebody like a man who is really comfortable with uh, with things which would make me very jealous and upset and hurtful in some way. In my mind, I'm like, well, it's because they have difficulty attaching. That's why they're able to put up with it. That's why I said not long, not healthy. Right. Not healthy. I yeah. get it. Yeah. Well, that that's I, I think that's I mean, unless we're talking, I mean, I'm distinguishing here between people who, let's say, serially cheat, lie. Um, can't actually attach to one person, like uh, are looking for some kind of what I would think of as compensation for something else that's bothering them. I'm not talking about that. I'm I'm specifically talking about ethical non-monogamy, mm -hmm. which I find really interesting. It's it's different from my generation. A, a lot of my younger patients are coming in with that, and I'm watching it closely and finding it really interesting. And um, these are people that are devoting like an enormous amount of like emotional and intellectual resources to thinking about other people. They're deeply involved in relating, like way more than I'm relating, and I'm like an analyst. But they're caring and relating and thinking about fairness and equality and the goodness of other people is top of mind for them. So this is very, very far from sociopathy. And they talk very openly about like jealousy, possessiveness. It's not like they're denying those kind of feelings. But the overall message they're bringing into my office is, okay, we might be we might have to struggle with those kind of feelings, of feelings left, feeling left out of certain kind of relationships, possessiveness, but they're gaining a certain kind of both joy love more love the more love the more love because getting fun more love because more people because there are more people to love more people to have sex with more people to like learn from and there's something about this kind of expansive community that is less you know let's circle the wagons around my little turf and my tiny little family that is the future i mean there's there's kind of a real vision about what's coming in the way they're conducting and it's really not a lot about sex it's about community, relatedness, different kinship structures, and it's even about like different economic structures. They struggle with what's mine, what's ours, like how much can we share. It's it's kind of an evolved philosophy. I want to give it a try, sweetheart. No. Okay, go ahead. It's not That's of our very generation. Scary it's, to me. It's, it's it's. I under, do, they, do you think we, we have young children, and I'm like, oh my god, what is it going to be like for them when they're getting into? It? We have a 29 year old also. Yeah. Who tells me about his relationships and he was recently last year involved with someone who was married had four kids and wanted to be with him and i was like what is going on here you know it's scary to me it's not i, I don't want to say abnormal it's not abnormal yeah it's scary it's scary yeah, yeah. because yeah, i i understand Could, do you do you want to say what scares yeah, you? Because be, because of the, what Noam was saying earlier, you know, there are emotions that go on. People get jealous. People kill one one another over these kind of love type of triangles. And I'm like, I don't know. It's right, but people, you know, in certain parts of the world, people kill. I mean, a, a, a brother can kill his sister because she was raped. Right. It's it's right. partially culturally that. determined. Yeah. It's not from within. It's it's what kind of. What is the kinship structure? What is the ideology around your relationship that you're living accordingly? I mean, this is, they're not alone. They're, they're, they're building communities. I agree. But, you know, there's something, there's a lot of reality shows about this now yeah. that, that are coming out. And I, I do watch a few of them. And it, within that um, group of people, there is all of those things that Noam was saying. There's jealousy that one doesn't want her to be with the other person. And there's always one person that's in control of that group. So mm -hmm. to me, it's kind of cult-like also because there's always one person who is in control of who's going to be where and do what. To me, that's not something that's like shared and we're all agreeing. Yeah. And that's not communal. Yeah. That's cultish. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I don't know any of these shows, but that that is interesting. That would worry well, me Well, all too. of those poly shows too. This is the male that's married to all these women. You don't, you know, there's a new show now where there's a woman who's with two men. And bringing on a third into her home, you know, into her relationship. But so you're saying some of these arrangements are around like one kind of cultish personality. Yeah, one person who's in control of everything that's going on. I think Orn is saying that uh, 
that that's doesn't not have what to I'm be, seeing. But yeah. doesn't have to be the case. But it that's can, interesting. It, well, what she's seeing is what what's interesting for a television producer to. I see. Show, yeah. yeah. No, but, but I, I've seen that. Look, we I we know people who were swingers. We know. I, know. I know people it's who've tried also, polyamory and and without exception they've it's been a phase and it, they yeah. they couldn't actually pull it. Yeah. But that doesn't right. mean that nobody can pull it. Right. right. And right. So I know plenty of people that go through that as a phase of their relationship and then they're like, "Ugh, it's too much. Yeah. Too much right. to deal with. It's too much responsibility, too much pain, too much to think about and then they're like, "Forget it." Well, I, I, let's this would be interesting to me. Can I just go back yeah, of course, also go to ahead. one more thing about yeah. like biology yeah. um, and and gender differences and 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 what and where human nature is you know yeah what's your what is your view of so, human nature first of all just in terms of like studies like about sexuality it's what's funny is that when you do real studies about sexuality women are the ones that are novelty seeking so women get very habituated to sexual and lose interest in sexual partners. Oh, you don't have to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the explanation. Uh, uh. <laughs> um, way faster than men. So it's not rooted in biology. I really do think it has to do with like masculinity, ego, like, and, and the way women are kind of... Well, social. is what you just described rooted in biology? What that, I, what that, I just that said? women are, are, are women losing interest quickly. I don't know, but it's, I important, know. it's important to know, right? Because how could I don't you, know? How? I'm just telling you that empirically, yeah. Yeah. like that's what the studies show mm -hmm. that even though women are kind of given the role of like being the ones that are like relational and kind of pulling the relationship together, and the men supposedly are pulling out sexually, women lose interest faster. So it's, it's so, so you know you could think that part of this whole the way people are socialized is that, is that women are actually, you know, their their feet are tied in many ways because of this inclination. So relatedly, I'm sure you know this, when AshleyMadison.com got hacked, which was this website for uh, oh. people to find uh, extramarital affairs. Right. It got hacked? Mm -hmm. This is about seven, eight years ago. and, and That's the, funny. The, the, what it, happened with the hacking? They found that it was something like 90% men Mm -hmm. and 10% prostitutes, that virtually no women were, on were that actually site? on that site seeking the novelty. Right. That, that the, 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 my presumption was that, that women, if they wanted to uh, have extramarital affairs, they didn't want anonymous affairs with, so much with somebody uh, on, on an app. They wanted romance or whatever, whatever corny right. thing you want to put there. But, but this, and this is a pattern, of course, if you look at any online sex uh, Craigslist or whatever it is, they're all ads for um, women twer geared toward, uh, aimed at men or gay men. Toward gay mm -hmm. men. You don't see a market for women doing this stuff. So why is that? And well, what women are, I mean, first of all, the world is quite dangerous for women. I, I think it would be pretty risky for women to go out there and like look for sex. I mean, that's like a basic fact horrible fact about the world we live in so i think it's super risky first of all literally risky but also psychologically and sociologically i mean women are not supposed to like and want sex it's not the way women are raised so they're not going to be suddenly jumping out of this whole like social narrative and like going on i don't know what websites and and looking for sex it's just like Rob, I'm asking why. Why I'm I, saying it's. Like I, I it's don't think dangerous. It's well, but what about what about the? I don't think it's the same. What what it's, about it's, to some extent there might be a safety issue, but I don't think it's the, the drastic difference was. Well, safe. what about the argument? Because so you I, could you could I'm sorry I'll let you, yeah, because you could create if that if you if there was a market for it, you could create a a safe way with, you know, I mean you could create there a brothel. No bro safe you could, way. You could create a safe brothel for women if. <laughs> women wanted <laughs> a brothel. You could do that. Right. S some smart Israeli would figure out how to invest in that. In uh... or or a strip <laughs> a, a strip club that's well monitored. Yeah, that's you right. know that's a strip clubs another way. Yeah. There are strip clubs for. Women. Yeah, but you're not, you're not, you don't have women getting hand thing. jobs women in the VIP want, room. Strip exactly. Clubs. Women are not and like they, like men. As I say, well, that's say, what I'm getting at, but that's what I'm trying. The, to the argument often made is that uh, evolutionarily, men can have uh, can can. You know, they 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 don't get pregnant, so they're not that uh, they don't have to be quite as cautious uh, having sex because they're not going to get pregnant, so they can just 
Yeah. And, the, and, and well, the argument goes further that they want to spread their seed as much as they can because... Who, men? Evolution teaches that the person who, oh, Lord. That who, who reproduces the most wins. So men, if the more they have sex, the more likely they are to pass on their DNA. There's women no man can only running wi- around there running around saying that no of course there's whole books written about this and <laughs> but and women can only have one child at a time so evolution- they better make sure that it's the right one evolutionary psychologists we've had them on the show from Harvard believe that this manifests itself in, in behavior patterns I'm not for I, against well, women women have to be I, cautious the, the, the few children that they can have relatively speaking they got to choose wisely. I think generally we oh turn to these kind of <laughs> biological explanations when we kind of don't know what to do with like the information that's in front of us. I, I, I don't believe that biology explains these things. Well, we see biology explaining behavior patterns in other animals. Okay. I, no? think, I think humans are like incredibly complex, change over time a lot. And the way we behave around sexuality and what we regulate and what we don't regulate changes across cultures, changes across time. I really don't think biology is our is our place to go for. I think you guys biology. are going to have to agree to disagree. Yeah, this, th- this is the disconnect f- f- that I've had my whole life with um, psychoanalysts, and some of them are very f- good friends of mine. And actually, my uncle who died was was uh, Mel Brooks's uh, uh, psychoanalyst. Are you supposed to be? Are you supposed to be? Uh, huh? Divulging that this is fifty years ago. Or something. Oh, yeah. That's great. <laughs> um, that I, I'm not able to think that way. My 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 thought process is is that humans are animals like every other animal. I and, believe we are. We and, are right. And to and to think that a a something that controls every other animal doesn't control humans is in, without without somebody proving that to me or showing me data that can demonstrate that i'm like well no the presumption is obviously to me that men and women are different in humans in humans just like they are in every single other species on planet earth why would we be different? I don't we, think we share 99 percent of our dna i think we are different and mostly the same as you're saying and in some ways different but yeah. the ways in which we like to imagine that difference is very much um influenced by other concerns mm-hmm. because if you think, for example, about sexual behavior, it really changes so dramatically between cultures and across time that you can't go, you can't boil it down to DNA. How did, that's interesting. How does it change between cultures? Just think about, like, I don't know, go to Scandinavia and then go to Saudi Arabia. We're, it's not the same species sexually. Well, it's because men control the women in Saudi Arabia. Just what people do with their bodies. Is there? It's just is there, that it's not the same species. The way they think about sex, what they do with each other, it's it's and it's, it's all cultural, not like it's right? like. Is, is there a culture cultural. either today or in the past where women behave as 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 we uh, uh, stereotypically uh, see men behaving? That is to say, that they have sex with. Uh, with 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 without emotional attachment, uh, with I, I, multiple by the partners. Way, most men that I work with have sexual behaviors with very powerful sexual attachments, and actually, one of the things that I see over my lifetime working with couples is that in marriages, often men are the emotional rudder of the marriage meaning they're way more loyal and they, they, they kind of keep the marriage together way better than women. So That's interesting. Yeah. I would have thought they're, of it they're like, the opposite. They're like, they're like <laughs> shepherd dogs that circle around the marriage. Really? really? I'm serious. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I'm serious. Wow. They, they, they ultimately, they provide, they take care, they, they, they circle around the marriage and they keep it together. And in certain ways, they're more reliable emotionally than women in, mm-hmm. in that respect. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. You just dropped a truth bomb. Well, you think that's true in our marriage? Yes. You I, think that I, I, I hold it together? Yeah. How so? He doesn't, he, first of all, Noam's more emotional than I am. He, he, more oh, what? Emotional than I am. You've always been. What do you mean more emotional? Like you're, like when you're with the kids, you, you, 
no oh, more like, like more no, affectionate with the kid. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She doesn't mean so, she doesn't mean like high strong. She means like yeah. Yeah, yeah. In, in that kind of way. I'm the one that's emotionally immature. I'm the one that's having the outbursts and I'm yeah, done with women, this. And that women, women are. Th- yeah. There's a lot more. But um, yeah, and he's the one that's always keeping it together. Where mm-hmm. I'm always like, what the hell? What am I doing here? <laughs> like this is crazy. Yeah. So it's kind of like, but not that I want to leave or anything. It's just always. I think that. Look, also, a lot of what you're saying is culture, and a lot of it is our backgrounds. We both yeah. come from homes where our parents are divorced. Mm-hmm. So I think for us, marriage really means something different than someone else going into a man- marriage. We went into this thinking we're never leaving each other. Yeah, You know, that's th- that's our mindset. Well, yeah, but, but we, we, we both came from divorced families, and you can tell me if you don't want me to talk about this, but uh-huh. we came from very different backgrounds. I came from a very, that, yeah. very uh, stable in a certain way, you know, uh, and and very loving. My stay, my my father raised me, and I had a stepmother. Yeah, came, but I but I I had a very very stable loving home. Right, mm-hmm. and, and she I had, did not. And she had a lot of trauma. A lot yeah. of trauma. Yeah, uh, it, a lot of abuse with my parents. My, yeah, she, my she, parents she, to each other. Well, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So divorced though. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So still abuse before they divorced or after? Oh, before. Before. Yeah. Yeah. During their marriage. Yeah. Yeah. So, but that stays with you forever. But she also, it's with, so with traumatizing. Craziness yeah. with her family and, yeah. and, uh, I mean, a lot I, of abuse in my family for sure. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's, it, it, night and day. And you right. said you're Puerto Rican? Mm-hmm. Half Puerto Rican. Half Puerto Rican. And, and half, half Indian. And half Indian. Yeah. So, where, like, you know, I grew up Wait, where so all of the who women, was what? My mother's Puerto Rican and my father's Indian. But all of the women, um, the majority of women in my family are divorced. You know, they don't stay in relationships. We don't hang around for that kind of bullshit. Mm-hmm. We're out, you know. Th- that was th- what it was like in our relationship before we got married. The minute that he said whatever, I was like, okay. And he had said, oh, my God, you're not going to ask any questions. Do you remember that? You were like, any time that he was like, I want out, I was like, see ya. <laughs> you know? So, and Spoiled that's, again. <laughs> that's, that's really what, because that's how I was raised. That's yeah. what I saw the women do in my family, you know? And that's how we're built, you know, kind of different. He's always like coming back and keeping it together. <laughs> I'm hold, I, I hold the family together. <laughs> he does. Yeah. yeah. That, but that but is. that but they're still very different sexually. Insofar as Noam, uh, you know, has uh, you, you would would uh, perhaps my be wife got op- around to open to uh, open <laughs> to uh, you know uh, ethical non monogamy and and. and, and, <laughs> and, and Juanita is. I'm open to non ethical non monogamy. <laughs> First of all, he's not open to any of that. He's the most jealous person. I've gone through hell with this man, but if he ever found out that I cheated on him, we wouldn't be together today. That's the difference between the two of us. You know? If I cheated, we would be together? Yeah. We are together. You did no, cheat, but right? I'm, I'm, Before I'm, we got since, married. Since we're married, I'm talking about. No, no. no okay, we would not we, be we would together. Not be, okay. You know that. Okay. Even for the, chi- <laughs> even for the children? Even for the children, it's but maybe she, you know maybe the opposite. Because the truth is, if she cheated, uh, depending on the entirety of the circumstances, I might stay together for the children. I might say we have we have to try to work. Yeah, but you it. wouldn't if, love I, me the same. Why would you want to be with me? I I don't I don't know if, if I'd what? love you the same. I might. You wouldn't love me the same. There would always be that resentment that I went out and cheated on him. You know. You can, I can resent a lot of things. It just had us a list, but but that, I don't I don't know. No, I'm, I'm, I know you. Yeah, it would no. She's right that it would eat me up inside. He would not. Yeah. yeah. However, that's on one side of the ledger of my life. I right. That on the other hand, the idea of my own loss in not being with the the, the kids right. and 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 what it would do to the children, that's right? Just tremendous. So to you me. would just stay married to me? Would you Would you want to sleep with me after I cheated on you? I I don't know what I would. I I don't know what was. Po- I don't know what's possible for me. <laughs> No, this I'm being serious. I don't know what would be possible for me emotionally to overcome. I can't mm-hmm. I can't say that and and what mm-hmm. amount of time well, you'd also it would take to, to get know, there. You'd, you'd need to know why, what happened. Well, and, right. what, as I said, the entirety was, of the circumstance. Yeah, what was going on in between the two of you that led right. to that? Yeah, I mean if it, it was during a period of your marriage where you you know you were drifting apart yeah. and I mean if it was if it was if it was Jason Momoa yeah. and you had a few <laughs> drinks but but I'm just, I'm just the only point is saying that I I would I would very much try to keep my head about me and say well you know yeah it sounds great fuck this bitch I'm out of here but you know there's there's three other lives yeah but there's profoundly something affected by this I think if I hated if we hated each other that would be bad for the kids too 
So there's, there's no easy solution. We hate each other sometimes. We love each other. There are days where we hate each other. I'm just saying, for the kids to grow up, I don't want the kids to grow up. At some point, you would know better than I do, but I, at some point, the balance tips where the unhappiness of the home right. is worse than the breakup of the right. home. Right. right. That's, that's a difficult thing right. to call. I think what... I, I would try to figure that out. Well, well, this is why I think about us works and why Noam is so lucky. Right, because <laughs> sounds like I, you're both lucky. Yeah, we are. But um, I don't, I don't ever hold anything back. I don't hide. Oh, I'm so lucky. Yeah, you're so lucky because <laughs> it's not like I walk around every day like, oh my god, I, like if if I feel something, I say it. It just comes out. I can't hold anything in. So he knows if there's a day where I'm upset that he didn't take out the trash or pick up his clothes or whatever it is. I don't ever hold it back. I'm not like holding on to it for days. I let it out. And then it's gone. Yeah, but you, you know, know, now that you're getting closer to menopause, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to mm-hmm. make the same excuses for you that I've been making all this. <laughs> but I've always been that I mean, way. She's on PMS. Oh, no, she has a period. Or I, yeah. It makes right. me feel better. Exactly. Oh, she has a period. Like, oh, she has a period. <laughs> but but I've menopause always lasts a very long time. Yeah. Right. So, but that's just how I've always been in our relationship from the get. You know. So for him, he he always knows where he stands. It's not like oh, I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah. That kind of thing. Uh, so so wait. So you're saying that's why it works. I think that's why it works for him. You know, there's no... <laughs> Meaning he doesn't have to imagine yeah. all sorts of scenarios. That's right. He knows if I'm not happy and I tell him I'm out, I'm out. You know, it's not like... And why does it work for you? <sighs> because I know him too. I know that he loves me. And I know that he's, you know... <laughs> <laughs> After 25 years, you know, fill, the, fill the on the roof. Yeah. Do yeah. you love yeah. me? Do yeah. I what? Listen, there's so many times that he's left I and ran you. back to me. It's like, where are you going now? It's like, you know? Anyway. We're not playing that game anymore. We're, we're almost out of time. So you've written a lot about um, the vicissitudes of attachment and trauma and how they um, how they shape people's lives. So I, I'll tell a, a quick story. I told a story once before. Now I I am I am going to acknowledge that there are things going on in our brains all the time that we are not privy to and and we don't realize them. And the the story um, I don't know if you know this story. When I was with, uh, I think it was with Ava and I, and I, licorice, remember the cat licorice? Mm-hmm. Licorice was never an affectionate cat. It was always running away. Like basically always. These are affectionate these are to pets? me. To you, but not to me. What? These are pets? Yeah. Licorice. A, a pet. A cat. Uh, this, this, of course, anyway, to, to, to try to condense it. A cat, which I had never been very attached to. Never. I took, the, at the end of its life, I had to take it to the vet to be uh, put to sleep. Eesh. And I put it to sleep, and, uh, and I said, do you want to stay with it? I stayed with the cat. And then I came out, and, this, and, and um, I was like, well, how was it? And I didn't, wasn't feeling anything in particular. I said, it was okay. They, they put it, and all of a sudden, I burst out crying, just burst out crying out of nowhere. Wow. wow. Some, and I didn't see it coming. I did not realize that this was going on somewhere, in, and, and it just erupted. That's the word. It just erupted in me. So that was not that I didn't believe it at the time, but it, but it was a clear, it was a clear proof positive to me that there was some other. You think about a computer when you control Alt Delete and you see all the processes. There was there's a process going on there, or a number right. of processes going on there all the time. Yeah, which you're not aware of. They're taking your bandwidth, and um, and they affect you. Yeah. And I believe from from the reading I've done of, of what you've written that you believe a lot of these processes are instantiated early in life. Yeah. And they remain there forever yeah. unless somehow you can it's your job I guess to, to get it well, somehow one way. I and mean there are many ways. Yeah, there are many ways so that people that. kind of yeah. reach in. I mean what you're talking about is the unconscious, right? Mhm. And there are many ways that people can try to make contact with the unconscious, not only through psychoanalysis. I mean, people do it through art. People actually actually do it a lot through comedy, right? Like jokes and humor is a way to kind of yeah, um, um, kind of loosen the boundary between the conscious and unconscious mind, and and and, and get in touch with things. Dreaming is huge. Uh, meditation, I mean, now psychedelics. I mean, there are all sorts of ways that people want to get in touch with their unconscious. And all throughout the centuries, they've, they have. I mean, Joseph in the, in the Bible, I mean, they're, they're a dream interpreter. People want contact with all this stuff that's going on in the back of their mind. And, and what, kind of, what kind of success maybe you can 
tell us your best success stories. What kind of success can a, a, a psychoanalyst have in actually relieving somebody of some sort of trauma, whatever it is, in such a way that actually changes their life? Like, cha- yeah. They, they stop, they, they end a pattern of behavior which is damaging to them and has been for many years. Lots and lots and lots. I mean, that's the work. I mean, and it, we have ongoing I don't know, success. That That's the purpose of the work. Um, but how does it work? Does it come from just how does acknowledging it? it? Does no, it? it doesn't come from... I mean, analysis takes a long time, and the reason it takes a long time is, first of all, it takes a long time to build a relationship, first of all, that engenders trust, that people can, like, relax enough and... and relax their defenses against knowing enough that they would like allow certain things to come into the fore, to come into the material. And then they have to have an experience with the analyst that to some degree will correct whatever happened. So if someone, let's say, grew up in like a super abusive environment Mm -hmm. and their their whole system is geared towards self-protection and being paranoid and assuming that everyone out there is out there to hurt me, and that's how they're geared towards their relationship. I mean, so this, you actually hit on something, because we have this all the time, where I'm much less, I'm much more encouraging of my daughter, walk to the store, whatever it is, we live in a very safe town, yeah. and she carries all this baggage mm-hmm. of the danger of the world, right. which is not rational, actually, mm-hmm. based on statistics and you know where we live and whatever it is yeah mm-hmm. and she knows in some ways it's not rational yeah but she can't get past it right no. she's not happy unless right yeah, i'm like so Mila, what, I, yeah i don't like the kids to go anywhere by themselves you have this like orientation yeah. towards the world that bad things can happen yeah i grew up in a really bad neighborhood bad yeah. things do happen yeah <laughs> so let's say you yeah. carry that in your way right. of being in the world and and in analysis let's say you're in a safe enough environment that you can allow your mind to start remembering those things, kind of understanding how they shaped you, Mm -hmm. and then be vulnerable enough with your analyst that you're going to allow maybe some new kind of experiences to register. And they're going to be intense enough because you're really attached to your analyst. So it's going to be intense. I mean, I think I've had new new experiences, right, that are not abusive or whatever, but you you just don't let go of the old but in analysis you, you do. do that's what the, mm-hmm. the idea is that first yeah. of all the experience in analysis is intense and that you connect like words and thought and narrative to those feelings and you start really morphing it's like you're going into that like program and you're changing the code right but it's a lot of work and a lot of trust and a repeat you have to do it it's and, like and, and it's so deep because it's not just isolated to that one issue that issue becomes an issue between me and you. This causes a fight that mm-hmm. erupts and then yeah. it brings on a whole nother issue. It cascades. Right. It, 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 you know, so, but you have your work cut out for you in your profession. Yeah. <laughs> now, just, yeah. yeah now, you have, wanted to ask about adoption before we go. Wait, wait, no, oh, I have a yeah. question too. So you, have you ever had a couple that you just saw and you were like, listen, this is just not going to work out for you guys. You Probably guys should not be together. Do you, you ever have that? Not, I don't them? see it like that, like but that. I've had, I mean, it's rare. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm kind of a, an optimist and a romantic and I, I kind of hope the best for people, but I've spent time with couples where I felt like they're too, in a way, addicted to the fight. Mm-hmm. And they didn't really, they couldn't really let go of it. And whatever I was doing was just not working. Right. Uh, and then I say, if you're hurting each other so much, maybe you should think of another way to live. Right. Like why cause so much pain, mm-hmm. like mutual pain? Yeah. Yeah. But it's rare. Do you see that? Most yeah. people don't want to fight. Right. I but like, I there like is a thing about being addicted to the fight. Yeah. Yeah. It's quick discharge. Well, no, I, I, as far as the adoption, I just figured if we couldn't cover the time, no, we could talk ahead, about no, adoption. It's a question. It's really not. I mean, unless you'd rather talk adoption. about climate change. Well, well, I don't want to talk about climate change. Dan, Dan, Dan has, has an obsession with... I don't have an obsession. And we, and I don't adoption. have an obsession. Is it a trans adoption? I, I, not trans I don't have an obsession yeah. with it. I just, I wonder about the wisdom uh, of, of, of cross-racial adoption uh, I, I well, I wouldn't say that about wonder. About it sounds like Archie Bunker. I, I wonder if it's if if it's the optimal. In other words, you're you have two couples that want to adopt a black child. You have a black couple and a white couple. 
should consideration be given in your estimation, and I don't know if this is necessarily your field of expertise, but should consideration be given to the ethnic background of the parents when deciding which couple to give this child to? That's, that's an intense question. I mean, the wisdom nowadays in the adoption world, and it changes, is that you should get, if it's a black kid, they should go, if, if there's a choice, they should go to a black, black parents to prevent, you know, whatever you want to call it, colonization or... Oh, that's terrible. Oh, well, cultural, culturally, they're, they're more suitable to, to a black family. No. But I don't know what that means. Like hair but they, and things like that. Meaning they will yeah. look more like yeah. their parents. I don't. Right. That's what you mean. And yeah. they will. They might have less um, questions about identity. Right. But that's just one way to think about things. Because you know, if the parents are going to be loving, they can help the kid through whatever shit they got to go to. I that's, mean, everyone goes right. through shit. That's right. But. The, the wisdom nowadays is try to match people to their cultural background. Well, um, with regard to the colonization question, I mean, don't you think that perhaps, you know, this notion that the white savior has to step in and save the black child. Yeah, that is uh, not a good optic. You know, um, w- would that affect the child's self-esteem, knowing, well, you know, I it had to be white people to come in Look, and this, save this, this, right. this, 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 this is my layman view on it. Um. It bothers me very much that people overlay the political uh, trendy, you know, the, the, the political uh, zeitgeist of the day, because these things change every 20 years, you mm-hmm. know, onto these kids. Yes, of course, I, I, we have to be uh, uh, honest that if two, if a black family adopts a black child, there's fewer awkward moments where someone assumes it's the nanny or, or with these kind of things. You know, these, these things are real. On the other hand, what does all that matter? If, if you have a, a loving f- home mm-hmm. with responsible, loving parents, these things are not going to upend the mental health, in my opinion, of a child. Some kids are overweight. Some kids are ugly. Some kids are, Everybody has something. By, by that logic, we should never bring a fat kid into the world because think of what, think of what I mean, that's nothing compared to what a fat kid has to go through. Right. But, you know, fat kids lead happy lives, mm-hmm. too. Yes, right. of course, they have the fatness issue. You know, they... And and people have worse things in this, um, but in but, this in this particular moment in culture, it's it's a very complicated issue. Yeah, but and but hopefully it's, in twenty years that's not going it, to be. It's complicated, but in some way it's um, I I've, I'm actually a, a offended by it because this whole notion of colonization, this is your own hang up that you're that you're overlaying on this family. Like they don't know about colonization. I'll tell you one other story, but. Is it, it might be the way to end or not, but when I was in summer camp, this always stayed with me. I don't know if I ever told you a story of it. I was like... Uh, the molestation thing? No, not... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was like... A rabbi did try to molest me. <laughs> uh, that's a true story, but he didn't... He, well, I, I can yeah. tell that story too if you want. Um, when I was like... I guess I had to be 14 years old, and it was, it was like rest hour in the bunk, and you're supposed to be quiet, and some kid had drawn a, a swastika over the bed, and I was using that as an excuse to misbehave over your bed yeah what? But, but, but not i don't even know if it was there before i don't i don't remember all the details but i was using an excuse to misbehave and the head counselor his name was carl lover and this, i don't know if anybody out there's new england music can be the head counselor huh what do you mean misbehave i wasn't being quiet i was acting out i don't i just uh, i got in trouble you this know? is music camp you said in music camp. carl lover was the head counselor he was a great man this was a, a, a he's dead now he's a this was a great man and um he i got in trouble with him and I said, yeah, but he, there's a swastika under there, and you don't know, as a Jew, what is, I'm a Jewish, what, he was, what, what it's like. And he said, will you just cut that out? You got to behave. This is a, this is a, you know, just shut, like, basically, I don't remember his exact words, like, 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 who are you trying to kid here? Right. And, you know, and he read, he saw right through me, That's and he right. was right. Mm-hmm. And, and, and he didn't, he didn't allow me to work myself into a lather, to convince myself, nothing. He's like, just stop, you know? Yeah. And today... No head counselor in his position would have dared, no. would have dared to say, "Go ahead." Canceled up yeah. the river. They yeah. would, they would have, they would have enabled yeah. and but and 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 actually allowed this child to develop and and to somewhere we had talking about Bruce Springsteen too, feeling sorry for those. And somewhere there's a healthy, it's mentally healthy for someone you respect to say, "You know what? Just stop feeling sorry. Shut up with this." Yeah. You know, I don't know. Where, as a professional, you have to be careful when you do that. But I'm, that is healthy. 
to me, it goes back to, to where we started with these two different mindsets. Like there, mm-hmm. there's a mindset in which you can like, if you're other than me, deplorable. Yeah. And identity politics is all around that. Or there's a mindset of like, let me try to understand what's going on over there. Wait, why did you put a swastika? Like, because kids do stupid yeah, things. There was no, right, there was right, no, right, uh, right. There was no deep anti-Semitic yeah. reason to yeah. it. Or maybe there was, but it, I don't know. But who knows? Point is, it, it really didn't bother me that yeah. much. Right. I, I was really just looking for an excuse to get out of right. the, the, But you can't ever look through what everybody knows, solve as like, come on. You, you know, you, it, it, and, and it's intoxicating to but do you know, know who they can that, that you can do that. And, yeah. and, and I didn't even really know it in those days, but now kids yeah. know it. That you say this, oh, say yeah. that, and the world yeah. stops. Oh, yes. You know that Twilight Zone with Bill Mummy? It's good yeah. that you did that with it, that kid who could erase yeah. everybody. Mm-hmm. Like everybody's Same very solicitous to anybody who says a certain, says anything. How about their lived experience? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but did you know who the kid was that did it, by the way? I mean, how, how? All, all I remember from the incident, and I was, and I was always very um, emotionally aware so you know the story, but uh, was that he saw right through me, and it was it was profoundly uh, shaping incident for me. I always remembered it, and I it always stayed with me as as kind of like you know don't do that, you know don't don't bullshit. Like so, when I was young, when I my parents divorced, I guess I they they must I must have been behaving in some way, or maybe they were worried. They took me to a therapist, and the therapist. The first day, he says, well, draw a picture. I was, I was five. She says, draw a picture. And at five years old, and I, this I remember, I was like, I'm not drawing a picture. I know what you make. I know whatever I do. It doesn't matter. Just draw whatever you want. And they're, they're so stupid, at least they were in those days. They thought I didn't know at five years old that, of course, whatever I was going to draw, they were going to use to... And I went like four times. I would. I just never drew a picture. And finally, my father, who was very anti-therapist, said, ah, "Enough of this." You know. <laughs> I, I do think most children probably wouldn't know. I mean, it sounds to me. You I don't. Were, I think a lot of kids. I mean, I don't. Was. I can't re- <laughs> think back to what would I. You know, my, me as a five-year-old. But it does sound. I think a lot of kids wouldn't. My son real. Manny would have known in a heartbeat. But no, actually, no. What you know he that your therapist wants to know get that, to know that, what's that, on that, your that, mind. No, that would be okay. Yeah. It, he. I. They. They would know that the therapist was lying to me by presenting it as an innocuous, just draw a picture, have some fun. Oh, yeah. I see. Re- Not you know, saying, I, I want to know what's on your mind. Yes, yes. I, I, I knew that they were going to judge me, but I didn't know what was what judgment could come from any particular yeah. picture. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Just drawing a picture of, you know... Mommy stabbing daddy. <laughs> they're gonna, they're gonna, you're gonna jump to conclusions. Right, right, right. But I just kind of like those things. <laughs> I was a macabre kid. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, At I, five. I, how do you know that though? That's so weird. I, it does sound like something that would be beyond the grasp of the average five year old. Yeah, for maybe, sure. Somebody maybe. told me go draw a picture. Yeah, I would think. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I that thing seems to be pretty sophisticated for a five year old. I think so too. Uh, maybe, but maybe but, but, if you're if I'm, I'm just like riffing here, yeah. like just. Just because there's a mic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. But if you're like growing up, if you're at an age like that where there's like um, conflict at home and you're trying to figure out what's going on with your parents, you learn to read cues very fast. Maybe. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah, not, yeah. it's not regular going on living. Right. It's like, oh my God, what is going on? And then you read yeah. the grown and, and there was terrible conflict between my father and my so mother. Terrible you learned fight, how to read everything. But Early. they, but they handled. She was it. an Israeli woman, much like uh, Orange. both Israeli. So I don't know if this is traumatic for you. To both Israeli, yeah. Both Israeli. Yeah, but your mother's more Israeli because she has an accent. Your father never did. Whatever. They both no. They're my just my, as Israeli. Except my, except my, <laughs> my, except my mother hates Israel, and my father was uh, <laughs> bled, bled is blue and white. So, but in, in any case, uh, they, they, there was terrible fighting between them, terrible screaming. I remember, I remember it, but uh, I never. Uh, they somehow they always managed to communicate to me that I was not part of this, that I wasn't responsible for it. I don't feel like I was traumatized by it. I never did feel like I was traumatized by it. Maybe I just don't realize. <laughs> it's yeah. not necessarily yeah. traumatic. Yeah. By the way, no, no, I'm just full disclosure, has expressed some skepticism about uh, psychotherapy in general. Is, is, has, has Dr. Garonic changed your mind at all? Well, no, you know, you haven't changed your mind. You've actually, you've actually um, um, <laughs> verified something from me. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because... Though you might bristle at this, I my it, it, 
as you recall, my opinion about psychotherapy has always been that an insightful person can be very helpful to people with their problems. My, my skepticism is not about the, the fact that, a, that a, a, an insightful person can be, can, can be very helpful. My skepticism has been about the science of it all, that you could, go to, that you could somehow put it on a blackboard and blah, 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 blah. I feel like probably whatever you have is much more just about your insight and your, mm-hmm. and your sensitivity to people then it probably is about what you've learned, learned. at NYU. And, and that's just been my gut feeling well, about It's a combination. That. A combination, but I, I said yeah. probably more. Because I think a lot of the science about therapy, you know, it, it, it holds up if the right insightful person is the person doing it, you know? But what, what do you even mean by the science? You mean like manualized treatments that like follow a certain kind of trajectory? I mean, that's, that's not psychoanalysis. I don't. I don't know. I don't know enough about it. Then yeah. I, I, I could read up, but I just, I just, uh, I've had. We've had conversations with other therapists, not with you. I, I'm, and you know what? I would say so. It hasn't. I've not had that feel with you, or just roll my eyes because they have an answer for everything, and it's always some sort of. Yeah, but that's not yeah. psychoanalytic. Psychoanalysts don't have an answer for anything. They listen and. Yeah, but they can. They can, They always manage to attribute it. Oh, that's because you're this or that. They always have a. They always have a theory for it all. Anyway, but but I I I I think money to agree. What yeah, comes yeah. Th- what comes through with you is a certain high level of um, un- understanding of humans. Thank you. And that I, I agree. Don't, I don't know that that can be taught. I agree with that. I don't know that that can be taught. I don't know if you can learn that in school. I think we, I've been through so many therapists with my son and then with Noam and a bunch of disasters. And there's only been two, maybe out of the bunch, including yourself, that I feel like you, know, did, you, you have some kind of connection of understanding what humans Well, in, 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 in line with what Noam was saying, do you think that there, just like there are some people that are talented musicians and some people that are talented athletes, is there such a thing as a talented therapist, somebody that was sort of born to do it, that's just, uh, that, 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 that is there an element that can't be taught? As Noam was saying, I you know, think I, so. there, there, I, I think there are different kinds of therapists that do different things. So I'm, I'm, for example, I'm not good at like helping people with their phobias or with their, if they have a particular OCD ritual that they want to get rid of. I'm not the right person for them because you of your training or because of something intrinsic of you. I gravitated towards a training that is like you know depth psychology. I like mm-hmm. to like sit with people and like whoa, go deep and, like, really, like, hold the world with them. Like, uh, that's my orientation. I mean, talk to me about spiders. I'm like, I don't know what to do. Is CBT that. better for that kind of thing? Yeah. yeah. it is. Yeah, and I'm not good with that. That's not what, I've, what I'm what i interested in. I didn't study it, and I wouldn't be good at it. Right. So, so if there was someone going okay, to so see that- a psychologist for ADHD, what kind of psychologist would they go they to? They should see someone who focuses a lot on... Cause and effect, behaviors. I mean, ultimately, some analytic work could be interesting too, but ADHD, I mean, there's a lot about like cause and response and how to create kind of conditions that help the person like get to their best self. Right. It's, it's very behavioral. Yes. Right. Yeah. We, we have to wrap it up because, you know, they have to play this on the radio and everything. <laughs> but if you had a good experience, maybe in the future when there's some issue in the news or something that yeah, there's a... Yeah, this is... I, I, I love this. this yeah, is great. Is like this that. dog full grown? Is this like some full kind of mini husky? What the mini husky. The mini husky. Yeah. Beautiful dog, right? Yeah. Oh, oh, he's a And sweet. I don't know if you like comedy. Yeah, I oh, do. Well, you're, who's your favorite, who's your favorite you? comic? Besides Dan Natterman. Well, well he, right now, I'm, uh, there is a favorite comic that I... He's not exactly... I, you, I don't know if you'd call him a comic, but I'm interested in his work because of our team. But Gerard Carmichael... Oh, oh, sure. oh he's, yeah. He's, he performed here many Yeah, years. I haven't seen him in a while, actually. Yeah. Yeah. He was here a few months ago, but he's, I think he's mostly in L.A. right now. He's in between, but our, our team re- is, yeah. is following him with a documentary. Oh, a documentary. Okay. So I, I just think he's great. He's fantastic. Yeah. What, what, what and he has an interesting story because he What's came out as gay. Right. Oh. Right. Is he gay or bi that he came out as? He gay. came out as gay. Gay. Okay. Gay. And we know we, he, he definitely, that wasn't known. At oh. least it wasn't known by me. No, are you skeptical about bi men? All right, we have to go. <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah, we'd love to have hey. you in the future. We'd love to have you at the Comedy Cellar. Yeah, um, I'd love to. And, that would be uh, amazing. It's terrific. And uh, you can, maybe you can help my wife with a few things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Good very night. Fun conversation.